I hope you can refurbish this shit. Imagine it's October 26, 2000. This was a pivotal point in history for an American kid like me. I was just starting high school, the Twin Towers still defined the New York skyline, Bill Clinton was still president, the Y2K apocalypse didn't happen, and there was a new Sony console about to be released. Today is the launch of Sony's PlayStation 2, which would go on to become the greatest selling console in history. I don't know, your experience might have been different, but for me, childhood was not the best years of my life. I don't look back on them and think, man, I wish I could go back. That Hollywood trope where an adult lectures a kid about enjoying what they have now because life will beat them down later always rang hollow to me. Being a broke kid in a single parent household wasn't all roses. I think adults forget how being a legal slave to your parents in a society that makes it illegal to work before a certain age deprives you of franchise. It forces you to negotiate everything from a position lacking leverage. The one skill kids have, which is born out of necessity and desperation, is nagging, and I employed it. Maybe you remember what it's like not being old enough to work or convince neighbors to let you mow their lawn, but I do. I could maybe scrounge up $20 a week from one neighbor willing to let me work for it, but that wouldn't be enough to buy a PlayStation 2. So I had to spend mom credit. Like most forms of credit, mom credit comes with strings attached, mainly good behavior and grade stipulations. Not to mention a lecture about how it would go bye-bye if I screwed up. By the way, telling a teenager not to screw up is like telling a donkey not to It's just what they do. Convincing her to buy me one wasn't easy, but somehow I managed. Guess I'll be going to the store now then. And it was glorious. But then a year passed, the Twin Towers fell, we have a new president, a new war, and here were two new consoles to provide a much needed escape from far too much reality. Since I had already spent my mom credit, it was going to be impossible to convince her to pony up for both a Nintendo GameCube and Microsoft Xbox. I had to choose one and hope she agreed. I chose the Nintendo GameCube, and while I didn't regret it, my friends gave me crap about it. In high school, admitting to owning a GameCube, you can get beat up for something like that. Owning a PS2 was acceptable, everyone had one, but in North America, Microsoft had pulled off the impossible. One of gaming's most difficult tasks. Xbox had something the others didn't. It was cool, and owning one made you cool. They had a killer platform that was perceived among gamers, at least in my age group, as the cool one to own. When one of my friends got it, we were blown away by Halo. His house was the party spot for the next couple of years. Instant popularity. I remember another friend brought a 100-foot Ethernet cable and his Xbox so we could network them together and have epic Halo matches on multiple screens. Halo LAN parties were a thing. When I graduated and had a little bit of my own money, I bought an Xbox and joined my friends on Xbox Live playing Halo 2. And I often think back on those times. A number of my high school buddies graduated and entered military service around that time, fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq. I lost contact with them over the next few years, and I still don't know if they're alright. It was before social media made it easy to stay in touch. With what was going on in the world, the sixth generation provided my friends and I with a much needed escape. They were among my most memorable gaming moments. So entering the seventh generation, Sony and Microsoft were riding a wave of goodwill from gamers. And now that I had a bit of franchise and money of my own to spend, the hype was real. No more mom credit. The stage was set for the next generation. Before I go any further, I need to address the white elephant in the room, Nintendo. Having outsold the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3, the Wii is the undisputed champion of the seventh generation. That's not even at question, but Nintendo had a different strategy, focusing on what video game consoles are for, games. They decided quality is what people really wanted, and that chasing graphics was a fad with a lot of drawbacks. It adds cost, complexity, and all those bits, those precious bits, produce a byproduct lethal to electronics. Heat. Not only would they save money on the bill of materials choosing not to chase graphics down the rabbit hole, but they would avoid reliability issues too. Nintendo is the winner of the seventh generation console war, hands down. But let's get real. We were all on the hype train and Nintendo's weird Wiimote controller was a fad. Yeah, it was cool for a bit, but we quickly got tired of being forced to use motion controls and used a controller whenever possible. The Wii never really felt like the seventh generation. And while it sold well, its appeal was mainly to kids in retirement homes. Nintendo was just doing their thing, targeting the kid and family market. 
Maybe it was just because I was an adult now, and my generation of gamers had been conditioned to expect a doubling of graphics with every new console generation, but the Wii didn't feel next-gen. Whereas PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 were targeting a new audience, the hardcore adult gamer. People with a J-O-B that would P-A-Y for a transcendent experience worthy of being called next-gen. What's making you hype about the Xbox 360? I mean, it's Sony down. It's all about Xbox 360. They want to hammer Sony in all of its sell points. They want to kick their ass in online. They want to kick their ass in the interface. They want to have a bunch of great games. They want to get out there a year ahead of them and really, really take it to Sony. They want to be first. They want to be the number one console maker in the market. If they get the upper hand, I promise you'll put a bullet in my head before they have their fun. Having been beaten to market by a year in the previous generation, Microsoft raced to get there first this time. It was clear that was one of their most important goals. Both Sony and Microsoft would again prioritize what they thought people liked about the Xbox and PlayStation 2, dazzling graphics and photorealism. This is, this is magnificent. Oh yeah, ooh, ah, that's how it always starts. But then later there's running and then screaming. Let's take a look back at the boys and girls at Microsoft who are really behind this little white pillar of power. It's 80 times more powerful than its predecessor. We wanted to get a lot more CPU and graphics source power. We've got Dolby 5.1, we've got high def, everything's ready to go for you. People on Earth is our market. It's that simple. But of course, it's never that simple. They also wanted to increase their market share. Like a self-conscious adolescent trying to make new friends, to accomplish this feat, Microsoft prioritized looks to appeal to a wider audience. Microsoft went from big, black, and blocky with the Xbox to slim, ivory, and sleek with the 360. One of the core issues has been the design of the current Xbox. That system was gigantic. It was heavy, and it didn't appeal to anybody but Americans. One of the things we learned was, hey, we didn't build a box that was as universally appealing as we'd have liked. So in Japan, it was a little intimidating. It was black, it was big. And it wasn't something that they necessarily wanted to have in their home. In Europe, the black box wasn't as universally as interesting. And what we ended up with was this design. You can see the difference between the two. You'll be able to take the faceplate off and snap on a faceplate either absolutely personalized to what you want to do. This is our favorite feature too, is that we have the ring of light. It's the thing that tells you how many controllers are actually attached to the system. Okay, you ready for this big move? Oh, look at that. Ooh. I must say that the power adapter for this thing is enormous. It is the Godzilla of wall plugs. Yeah, it's jaw-droppingly large, but the design of the 360 means nothing. It's what's on the inside that counts. You should know that. That's why we're going to take a look at the guts of the Xbox 360. Take a look. Well, the HD era, we're really on this turning point for the industry. From the 2D to 3D generation of gaming, all sorts of things changed. We're now on the next shift, which is really from 3D to high def. With Microsoft racing to beat Sony to market, the graphics arms race was on. Wanted to get a lot more CPU and graphics source power. ATI shared that vision of how can we maximize the real performance for real games. But this would cause both Sony and Microsoft to push the limits of console design. Packing so much power into a confined space is a real challenge from a thermal design standpoint, but they also had to balance the physical design. All these things can affect what you can do from a design standpoint. When we go over to the hardware team, they say, oh my goodness, if you do that, that adds two cents. We're like, two cents? Oh, well, two cents times X million is a lot of money. There are a lot of departments making compromises, sacrificing one objective because of a higher priority. You're always balancing this ultimate design that you want to have against technological constraints, schedule constraints. We felt we had to be ready in 2005. It's important for Microsoft to come out first. The problem with rushing to meet a strict deadline is that you're often met with challenges that cost time. If you're prioritizing speed over all else, then production delays cut into quality assurance schedules and could lead to reliability issues being overlooked. If you haven't seen this video from Smarter Every Day, you should check it out. He's giving a talk to NASA Smarty Pants at an aerospace conference. I just want to show you some clips that I think are particularly on point. This room is full of people that are industry leaders that are in charge of taking humans back to the moon. 
what made Apollo a success? Let's just read some of them. Of course, the way we got this job done was with meetings. Big meetings, little meetings, hundreds of meetings. The thing we always tried to do in these meetings was to encourage everyone, no matter how shy, to speak out, hopefully, but not always, without being subjected to ridicule. We wanted to make sure we had not overlooked any legitimate input. That's how you feel now. But I don't know, a lot of people are scared to talk today. It seems like they might have had a little different culture. And that brings up an extremely important point about human psychology and corporate culture. If you do not provide a supportive culture where people feel comfortable speaking their minds, they won't. If you can't say something nice, don't say nothing at all. They'll instead tell you what they think you want to hear, or sugarcoat bad news, downplay issues, be apprehensive and timid when providing negative feedback when the situation calls for it, and speak up only when they have something positive to say. This is the thing, and that's a problem. That's a problem. You know the truth, and you're afraid to say it. I'm Destin, have a good day. Well, about 15 minutes late, Bill walks in. He's holding the PowerPoint presentation, and he walks up to the table, and he throws it down on the table, and he says, this is a insult to everything I've accomplished at this company. Leans across at me and says, why are you trying to, to kill Windows? You guys have lied to me. You guys have like played me for a fool. I start to try to argue for this, why we can't have the normal version of Windows. Bill doesn't want any of it. He doesn't want to hear it. He yells at me, he shuts me down. But you got a lot of alphas in the room and, and all alpha males. And so there's a lot of pounding the table and you're wrong, I'm right. By then Jay is up, he's ready to fight. And so then Jay goes in, then Robbie tries to talk to Bill and Bill yells at Robbie. If I'd had glasses on, I would have needed windshield wipers on him because he was spitting at us so hard and so fast. Bill would yell at us for a while about these different things, and then Balmer would take over on the business case, and the business case looked terrible. By now, and the reason it's called the Valentine's Day Massacre is because all Valentine's Day activities are now off. The candles at home, and they're melting, and you know we're all missing dinner. When you're working from paycheck to paycheck, have a family to support and a mortgage to pay, the fear of losing your job is an extremely powerful bias that works against the mission. If that mission is to provide a quality product, if it's not, you just want to make money on a piece of e-waste, then yeah, having a toxic corporate culture might actually help in the short run. But that slash and burn tactic will not gain you favor amongst hardcore gamers, and it certainly isn't going to work in military, aerospace, or automotive sectors where people's lives are on the line. Yeah, okay, maybe it's not that big of a deal for consumer electronics, right? They're just toys. You don't need an Xbox 360 or a PlayStation 3. That's just a video game console, a toy. It's not like it's an electrical device plugged into your wall and could burn your house down if there's a major manufacturing defect. The deal is we know things and we're afraid to say it. Why is that? Because we know the other side's gonna fight or we might get canceled or whatever's happening today in you know, your office. I totally get it. But it's really interesting. If you don't have positive and negative feedback in any system, it goes unstable and chaotic and things explode and break and it's bad. We're faced with finishing the design and wrapping our production lines at the same time. But as we're ramping production, consoles would fail at test stations. You don't take baby steps you take significant steps because you actually have to go towards the goal and there will be risk involved, but you make sure that the risk isn't too big so that the engineers on the ground can't learn the lessons. What is the mission? Don't get fixated on technology demonstration, focus on the mission. Keep it simple, as simple as you can make it and accomplish the mission, that's what we should be doing. Be bold, be courteous. Once a decision has been made, let's all get behind it and let's fight, but at the same time, let's be smart. It is imperative that you provide negative feedback in situations that call for it, and you are not scared to do so. If you lose your job for providing negative feedback, good on you. If it needed to be said and nobody said it, that would be the worst thing to live with. Christmas doesn't change, so your schedule is paramount, and there's just so much pressure to get it done by November. Three, two, one.
it's all about, folks. The Xbox 360. Bill Gates' behemoth of a company is putting on the biggest launch event of its kind that we've ever seen. Microsoft has filled this 400,000 square foot airplane hangar with thousands of gamers, hundreds of gaming stations, and live entertainment for an orgy of next-gen gaming that has been going on for the last 24 hours. And yes, I do realize that the phrase orgy of gaming does sound kind of nasty. Yes. That's right. I'm here in Hawthorne at the Best Buy Los Angeles. Those people are lined up. You're on TV. You'll be excited. All right. This is the man who bought the first Xbox 360. Was, was, was this a transcendent moment for you? Oh, yes. Now, now you guys actually have a pretty good story to tell because <laughs> you you traveled almost the longest distance to get here. Where did you come from? Cinetopia, Mississippi. By car. How long did it take you to do it? About 36 hours straight. Oh, well, blah, blah. How very appropriate. So there are two versions of the Xbox 360 product. First version is the Xbox 360 core system, which is a low cost system, loses no long term features. You can upgrade to the core system to the full 360 system at any time through aftermarket accessories. The Xbox 360 system, on the other hand, was optimized to have everything you need out of the box for a great gaming experience. The question is are any of you guys going to be getting the core system tonight? Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. They're laughing at me. All right, well, my goal by the end of the night is to walk this line of 400 people and see if I can find one person who's going to buy a core system. I'm here with Xbox executive Peter Marr. There was a Nielsen study that just came out today, which was interesting. It said, they asked all these gamers, when are you going to buy the next generation? They said, over 50% of the gamers say they're going to wait until they see PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 in the market before they decide which one they're going to buy. Do you think that's, is that what gamers should be doing or should they be jumping in now? I think there's no reason to wait. 18 right. great launch titles, high definition gaming, 720p output, 5.1 multi-channel sound, 16 by 9 aspect ratio, two times anti-aliasing in all of the games. Right. I don't know why you'd wait. Man has always been fascinated with traveling back in time. But now we know the Xbox 360 launch model was a terrible investment you should never have made. There are a lot of fans out there that want a 360 tonight. How many 360s are out there in stores around the US tonight? A lot. A million, nine hundred thousand, any numbers? A lot. A lot. All right. Yeah. Well, but some people say there's a shortage out there. You know, is that a marketing strategy or can you not produce enough? What's the real story on that? We can actually answer this question now. The following is from leaked internal Microsoft documents. So about a week after this interview, they say that by around November 30th, 2005, they had shipped 1.2 million 360s and 3% of customers called in with problems. 24% of these customers' consoles froze, 19% had flashing red lights, and 15% were from disk drive issues. Based on what we know about the Red Ring of Death, freezing and three flashing red lights is eerily familiar. So 43% of the issues these early customers were calling in about are attributable to the Red Ring of Death. That's just one week after launch. So far, it was only 3% of the consoles sold, within normal limits, one would expect. Hindsight is 2020, so now we know that number would rise, but they couldn't know at the time. There's nothing out of the ordinary here yet. More concerning was the probability that a console would be made without defect. This is called first time yield. FTY is basically the probability that a 360 goes through every stage of the manufacturing and quality assurance process without failing. And they said that was 56%. That lines up with Todd Homdahl's recollection. If you build a hundred of these things, only 50 or 60 of them would work, which is really, really bad. Like a real robust yield rate would have been 90, 95. However, first time yield doesn't consider rework or multiple attempts at each stage of the process process to get the console to work. That's what roll throughput yield is for. RTY adds in the ones that pass after rework, improving the yields. And in the leaked documents, they say this improved the yield to 71%. That means that there were 490,000 that failed some part of the process. Keep in mind that some of the motherboards will fail. The consoles will fail on the assembly line or be damaged by a worker or a machine. There's just a lot of steps in the process where it issues can cause a unit to get scrapped before ever reaching Microsoft's quality assurance for final testing. Only the ones that make it that far either pass and get sold at launch or fail and go into the bone pile. And speaking of the bone pile, the leaked documents confirm that the bone pile at this point was 200,000 units deep. It would grow over time to between 600,000 and a million units at the height as they ramped up production and as consoles later began failing. At the height, we created a bone pile that was over 600. 
600,000 units deep. We had you know, almost a million of them sitting in our bone pile. Although they were close, these are actual Microsoft numbers, not recollections by Peter Moore or Todd Holmdahl 15 years later. I need to point out that the way the producers framed pre-launch failures on the test bench in this Xbox documentary makes you think they were caused by the same issue they later suffered from. That's a juicy story, and I almost fell victim to it myself. However, the first-time yield issues were not the same as the GPU failures that caused the Red Ring of Death later. These are new chips that work fine for many thermal cycles before the defect can be exploited. Quality assurance testing isn't rigorous enough to expose this kind of failure unless it was particularly acute. As Todd said, a robust yield rate would be between 90 and 95 percent. So while 56 to 71 percent is not good, many of these errors could be corrected in future batch updates. That's not unusual for a new product line. Because we were trying to ship in high volume, there wasn't much time to think about it because there was so much to be done. One way of dealing with the failed consoles was to put them into these nice boxes and stack them so that you would get back to them at some future point in time. In a way, we were kicking the can down the, the road a little bit. We are developing what we call a bone pile. Microsoft management was taking calculated risks, betting these early production issues were the normal variety. It's reasonable for them to believe the yields would improve, and that gambit worked with the original Xbox. The problem with pushing schedules to the limit every time is Murphy's Law. Anything that can go wrong will, and at the least opportune time. You teabag Murphy one too many times, and he can't resist himself. But at this point, Microsoft didn't know there was a flip chip time bomb lying in wait. We are making as many as we can, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're flying them in. We try to get as many in for tonight for the fans like we've got behind us here. But more importantly, I don't know why you'd wait. In this little gamer shanty town. Gamers were looking to see whether we would get it right this time. And we thought that we did. We needed to be seen as the start of the next generation. And this all needed to come together flawlessly. Unfortunately, that's not quite what happened. This is called an E74 error. Contact Xbox customer support. It was in the forums and I started to notice that something wasn't right. I think there's something going on here. The criticisms that we're reading about are coming from the games press who are hearing from gamers who are saying, I'm having a problem with my box. You feel the top of the Xbox, it's pretty hot. We can hear retailers starting to say, there's an issue here. By the time PlayStation 3 launched, reports of 360 suffering from the red ring of death were making PS3s look like a better investment. We'd fix the ones in the bone pile, we'd send it back out to the customer, and it turns out that wasn't the problem, and it would break again. Get one back, turn it on, didn't even work. No! Again! People spent a lot of money on a console, and we're getting two and three of them back. Incensed, I'm sure there were those who thought, if you had to keep paying to replace your 360, you'd spend more than the price difference for a PS3. Maybe Xbox was manufactured e-waste, and they should just defect to Team Blue. See what Blu-ray is all about. I was mad as f I'm like, get this sh fixed, or I'm leaving. I'm joining the enemy. And as simple as that. I feel kind of sorry for it. Not really. So what happened? Both consoles had a hardware fault stemming from inappropriate choices in GPU packaging materials. Certainly, Microsoft and Sony were let down by their manufacturing partners. I've already made a video on the PlayStation 3's yellow light of death, but since it also afflicted the 360, I think it's important to take the opportunity to explain its role in the red ring of death. So strap in, we're taking the red pill. First of all, just like the yellow light of death, the red ring of death is a general hardware fault and doesn't have a singular cause. It needs to be properly diagnosed to repair what broke. The primary error code is indicated by the LED ring on the front of fat models, depending on how it lights up. The one we call the red ring of death has three flashing red lights. That's the one associated with general hardware faults and what became known as the core digital fault. To get a specific cause, there is a button combination to retrieve a secondary error code. When the console is in an error state, you hold the sync button and press eject, and the LED ring will display a value. Pressing it again will display the next value again and again, gives you a four value long error code. 
Check the Xenon Library Wiki for specific instructions for the 360S and E models. I'm only going to focus on the FAT models that had the Red Ring of Death issue related to Bumpgate. The Xbox 360 System Management Controller runs the show. Like the PS3 Syscon, it's the all-seeing eye of the 360. But unlike the PlayStation 3's Syscon, it's not a dedicated IC. The SMC is software running on an Intel 8051 MCS51 core built into the Southbridge. If anything goes wrong during the power on sequence or during operation, the SMC immediately takes appropriate action. If a single red light flashes and there's an E73 or E74 error on screen, that's known as a universal error message. But many times it won't get that far into the power on self test, and instead you get three flashing red lights. That's when you have to retrieve the secondary error code. The ones most associated with the defective consoles are O1XX errors. There are a range of different codes that indicate a communication issue between the GPU and its neighbors. For example, the GPU and RAM, among others. But the common thread is the GPU's solder joint which led to the first big misconception that it was caused by brittle lead-free solder balls. On July 1, 2006, the European Union's Restriction of Hazardous Substance Directive, better known as ROHS, went into effect. It mandated electronics sold in the EU must use lead-free solder. The issue with lead-free solder chemistries is they don't have the elasticity lead solder does. That makes them more brittle and prone to cracking. People noticed that the ROHS going into effect right around the time Microsoft launched the Xbox 360, and soon afterwards consoles started dying from GPU failures. They put two and two together and assumed the red ring of death was cracked lead-free solder balls. The ROHS was just going into effect and and to comply, they used lead-free alloys such as SAC-305, which is tin silver copper. This is more brittle than Eutectic 6337 leaded alloy. The GPU package is ready. It gets shipped to the assembler that uses a pick-and-place machine to mount all the surface mount devices onto the motherboard and then solder them in place using a reflow oven, which takes them through a series of heat zones. These zones form a temperature profile that can greatly influence the reliability of solder joints especially those that experience the greatest heat and stress, like a processor. If there are issues with the profile, some of these solder joints could be weak and prone to breaking. This is the seed of truth that made so many people believe the issue was due to cracked solder balls. Lead-free solder balls do break, and in the case of dropped consoles or shipping, especially in cold weather on bumpy roads, the vibration can lead to BGA failures. Even in regular use, it can happen, eventually. There's a lot that goes into designing a processor package, the motherboard and the cooling solution, all of which can influence whether the ball grid array will be reliable. In fact, BGA defects are such a common failure that it's the first thing repair technicians assumed. GPU issue? Reball it. And that seemed to work, initially. But you have to remember when a gamer's console dies, they send it in to be repaired. If the professional tells them it's a cracked solder ball and they fixed it by reballing, then the customer is going to assume that's what the issue was. The problem is that third-party rework professionals often aren't experts. They just know what they see most often and what tends to work. Since most of the consoles they get are from customers, they see a higher proportion of dropped, abused, and battered consoles that have legit cracked solder balls, or ports that get knocked, twisted, and jammed, which places stress on their lead-free solder and they break. And the number of those cases went up after the ROHS went into effect. So they put two and two together. Their experience working with common faults that were caused by accidents jades their perspective. And the customers don't know any better than what the guy said fixed it. But in this case, both the customer and professional are assuming incorrectly that it was due to bad lead-free solder cracking. To make matters worse, BGA rework requires specialized equipment and a great deal of skill, which means you have to shell out dough. That makes it inaccessible to most people looking for a quick fix. But that temptation is too great to resist. The idea that there might be a quick fix that'll get you playing in no time is an infectious zero-day brain hack the internet exploits virally. And that's what everyone did. They googled Red Ring of Death Fix, finding guides showing you how to use a heat gun to reflow the GPU, putting it in the oven, placing pennies on the RAM modules, wrapping it in a towel to intentionally overheat the console, blocking the fans with paper clips to do the same. There was even a bolt mod kit where you could literally bend the board to force the GPU into the heatsink with way too much force, over time leading to bent motherboards. It's bent. Not only is this extreme mod not a long-term fix, it's actively harmful and prevents it from being properly repaired later, but it was very commonly used 
because it did work in the short term. Even GameStop used it on refurbished 360s it sold. They even had the gall to label them remanufactured. A heat gun meant for stripping paint lacks the control necessary to properly rework flip chip BGA packages, and it's far more difficult than it looks on a YouTube video. But the heat from it, even if you don't actually melt the balls, usually does work. This is because the heat warps the GPU package such that it's physically holding the cracked connections back together. When something works, people assume they fixed the issue, that the results justify the means. But if it works, it won't for long. Most reflows and professional reballs fail within a year, if not sooner. That's long enough for people to post videos showing their success story and spreading the myth that it was cracked solder balls. But I think by far the most abundant myth is that the console was overheating. The 360's problems are heating up, literally. That spread like wildfire. I bet when I said they were chasing graphics, you were thinking it led to overheating issues. Users say the console's cooling system just can't take the heat of a lot of plague. That's a common misconception. These chips ran extremely hot, and it wasn't really until they found out the hard way that it was apparent that there was an issue here with the red ring of death issues. Even causing some people to claim the chips get so hot they can literally desolder themselves. Some faulty Xbox 360s are literally melting down while running certain games. Let's get this out of the way right now. The GPU cannot desolder itself. That's a complete myth. The dies have thermocouples inside them that monitor temperatures, and a fan controller set to maintain temperatures below a set point. It'll never reach temps high enough to melt solder. If the paste wears out or you intentionally overheat the console, the temps will climb and when they reach a critical temperature, two flashing red LEDs on the ring indicate the system is overheating. You can literally remove the heatsink from the die and when it reaches the high limit, where there could start to be issues related to peak temperatures, the SMC will automatically shut down the console to protect it. Even Microsoft themselves say the red ring of death wasn't about peak temperature. It was thermal, but it wasn't because of the peak temperature is because when the unit would get hot and then cold, hot and then cold, every time it did that it would stress the connection. Okay, fine. It's not desoldering itself. But what about bad reflow profiles and cold solder joints? Maybe the ROHS forcing them to go lead free caused them to have issues at the factory. I researched that too. The electronics industry had plenty of warning time before the ROHS went into effect, which allowed them time to develop the necessary reflow profiles. Cold solder joints doesn't explain the massive number of failed consoles, and issues like that could have quickly been corrected. Maybe a few early batches would be bad, but they'd be quickly fixed. It doesn't explain why the issue plagued 360s for the next two and a half years. All the proof you need can be had by looking a few inches over. The X CPU has the same lead-free solder and doesn't suffer from a failure rate anywhere close to the GPU. Since I don't work on these consoles as much as I do on PS3, I'm not exactly an expert, so I consulted a buddy of mine, Josh, who is. He said the X CPU has no reliability issues. IBM did their homework. I have literally never had to replace one to fix a console. I can speak to the PS3 CPU, which also has lead-free solder, and it's a tank. The CPU issues are exceedingly rare, like it's less than one in a hundred, and usually due to physical damage. Only the GPUs suffer from an increased failure rate, greater than is expected from BGA failures alone. It wasn't the lead-free solder something else was going on. That something was Bumpgate. In the case of GPU failures, the one that most commonly caused the red ring of death, the error progresses something like this. You start your console and the power on self-test completes successfully. The bootloader starts the operating system. You pop in a copy of Halo 3 for an epic round of Griffball. The GPU begins pumping out those watts and heating up. Your launch model Xenon has been programmed with a temperature target in the low 80s. So right now the fans are running at their default fan percentage when the GPU and EDRAM reach 70 degrees Celsius. This is the beginning of the phase transition zone of the underfill material. Modulus of elasticity begins decreasing. Basically that means it's going from hard and stiff to soft and malleable. That's bad. The entire purpose of underfill is to provide support to the bumps. If it softens, it may as well not even be there. As the GPU and EDRAM heat and cool from variable load, the coefficient of thermal expansion, CTE, causes it to expand and contract. Also, the bumps, interposer, the underfill do the same. Since each of their CTEs are slightly different, stress is placed on the bumps. All these little thermal cycles add up over time and will eventually cause the solder to fail. You get all sorts of stresses, and just like when you 
you bend something too many times till it finally breaks. That's what was happening. This is known as thermomechanical fatigue, and we can model it in computer-aided design software, which is made specifically for thermal design engineers whose job it is to know the process in even greater detail than I'm explaining here. The temperatures are higher than the underfill's TG, causing it to soften. Without underfill, the bumps can fail an order of magnitude sooner than otherwise, like in one to three years instead of 10 or more. But there is something worse happening. As the chip heats up, it expands. That's what's happening on the blue line. But there's another thing happening at the same time. While it's still hard, the underfill's thermal glassification temperature is between 70 and 75 degrees Celsius. So every time the console crosses that threshold, its CTE rises sharply just before it softens. There's a tensile stress spike. The underfill is literally pushing up on the die, which is pulling the solder apart. Because the 360 has a temperature target that's significantly above this transition zone, the TG, it ensures the temperatures can cross back and forth over that stress spike. And that further decreases reliability a lot. The bumps can fail far, far sooner. If you were trying to kill the bumps, that would be the best way to do it. I personally believe this is the reason we see an increased failure rate in the 360 versus the PS3. The PS3's fan table keeps their 90 nanometer GPU cooler on average, so it doesn't repeatedly cross over this stress spike. It gets close, and that reduces reliability, but it will take longer to break the bumps. Since 85% of the bumps and BGA are located between the RAM and GPU, this is what most red rings are caused by. While the joints that connect the GPU and CPU can fail, that'll cause a 0022, and that's a pretty rare code. As the bumps begin failing, the impedance increases, making it harder to train the high-speed data buses between the GPU and EDRAM, system RAM, and the GPU and CPU. This calibration procedure accounts for variations in circuitry, wiring, and loading delays that may affect bits differently. What Microsoft calls I.O. training, Sony calls bit training. It's critical to optimize signal quality across a high-speed interface because it calibrates the signal driver current, driver impedance, and ensures that the timing of data bits aligns with clock edges, effectively centering the data I, allowing for more accurate and reliable data transmission. The bootloader initiates the process and reports the failure to the SMC if it occurs. The SMC reboots the unit and retries up to four more times, five in total. If it still fails, it hangs and displays an error. If the bumps break after the console's already on, it'll freeze. But to you, it looks like this. The ball explodes after every score. Haha! <laughs> in your face, non-grits! Wait, what was all that stuff about explosions? On a PS3, this kind of error causes A043034 Syscon error codes. On a 360, Xbox system software errors get reported to the system management controller and cause a red ring of death. Secondary error code 01XX can be BGA, bumps, or simply a worn out die. When people assume there were lead free solder ball cracks, that was plausible, especially in the case of dropped or abused consoles. But most of the consoles recalled for the core digital error were caused by bump defects effects, like I just described. That was the primary cause of the Red Ring of Death in the launch models. Unlike the PS3, 360s have an error that proves this. Universal Error Message E73, E74, and E82, which is a high-speed input-output data link error between the GPU and ED RAM. The link cannot be trained or calibrated. If it made it past quality assurance, the only way this error can happen is from bump defects or the die wore out, from electromigration, for example. These errors cannot be caused by cracked solder balls. Now, if it is a slim console, you can see that E82 is displayed, and if it is a fat console, E74 is displayed. You may recall that Microsoft extended their warranty for E74 to three years due to the code showing up on fats much more than it should. And this was a clever way for Microsoft to not have to cover slims with this type of failure. So here is a FAT 360 GPU and the E74 error is when the high speed IO link between the GPU and EDRAM die fails. Now the high speed IO link is on this substrate interposer, this green part here, and links between these two dies 
and allows the Northbridge slash GPU die to train and communicate and use the 10 megabytes of EDRAM on this die here. Now the reason why this can never be the BGA soldering at fault is because none of the connections between these dies go to the motherboard. They are all localized on this green substrate interposer between these two dies only. The only thing from the EDRAM that goes to the board is the power, which would generate a different error code related to power, not training, and the thermal diode in the EDRAM, and if that failed, you'd get a 0013 thermal overload. So, since none of the connections relating to the operation of the EDRAM or the high-speed I.O. link go to the board, we know that it cannot be the soldering at fault. It is either one of these dies has failed, or the bond between it and this green substrate interposer has failed. The E74 error was specifically included as a visual example of a Red Ring of Death error in that Xbox documentary, and Microsoft themselves said, Breakthrough came when we understood that the connections that were being broken were not located on the motherboard, but they're actually located inside the components and they even showed a diagram of bump cracks. They didn't explain it this thoroughly, but those of us who are familiar with Bumpgate caught those details and saw it for what it was. Confirmation. Finally, they said it. The Red Ring of Death was caused by Bumpgate. The 360's GPU is a flip chip ball grid array. FCBGA. TSMC is the foundry that makes the actual silicon die, where the processing takes place and heat is produced. But they don't package it. They send the dies to a packaging company such as Taiwan-based ASE, Advanced Semiconductor Engineering, who package the chip. In this process, the silicon die is soldered to an interposer, aka substrate, which is just a carrier board that makes it possible to later solder onto the motherboard with the rest of the service mount devices. The way the die is attached to this interposer is critical to its function and reliability. It must be attached using the appropriate combination of materials and is such a delicate balance that it requires specialized tools and expertise to accomplish. That's why packaging companies exist. They specialize in this part of the manufacturing process. They prepare and solder the die to the interposer using a controlled collapse chip connection, C4, better known as bumps. Basically, they're microscopic solder balls. To improve the adhesion of the bumps, the pads are an alloy or coated with metal alloys, called the underbump metallization layer. The temperature must be carefully controlled. The solder chemistries can vary, but the bumps in this case are high lead, which means they melt at around 350 degrees Celsius. The underbump metallization is tied to the bump selection, which depends on electrical properties the designer requires. They used high lead bumps because it can carry more current. This means they don't need as many of them. The trade-off is they're more fragile and can crack. To protect the bumps, underfill is used. It's just epoxy resin with silica bead filler, basically very fine sand. They tweak the ratio of epoxy and hardener, add other doping agents and pigments to give it the color and physical properties desired, like thermoglassification temperature, TG, coefficient of thermal expansion, CTE, modulus, dielectric constant, etc. I'm not an expert on this complicated process, but somehow they clean, apply adhesion promoters, and underfill between the die and interposer, which involves a careful, temperature-controlled curing process so that bubbles, called voids, don't form. Again, this is a highly specialized procedure, and there are many ways it can go wrong which affect the reliability of the joint. So the expertise of the packager is key. Every one of those material interactions and their properties need to be carefully balanced with the bump chemistry used, or you'll run into problems. Like a billion dollar recall. This is why packaging companies usually employ a materials expert, whose job it is to stay well-versed in how they interact what you can and can't do. And that person should be consulted and sign off on the final design, because if there was a fundamental flaw in the material interactions, they should be able to spot it. This is complicated. Is it possible it was an honest mistake? Something anyone could have missed? To answer that question definitively, let's look at processors that despite having lead-free solder balls are still tanks. In collaboration with IBM, Amcor performed a process qualification on their low-K dielectric 90 nanometer process. 
In these studies, they correctly identify the issues with low K dielectric. This is the layer used to separate the microscopic transistors and traces that make up the internal wiring of the die itself. This low K dielectric allowed the die shrink to the 90 nanometer node and the power efficiency that comes with it. They experimentally determined the best bump in underfill materials to make a reliable 90 nanometer chip, showing underfill that's too hard cracks the die and too soft cracks the bumps. They even optimized the thermal classification temperature for high lead bumps. These lessons were applied in the XCPU and cell BE processors. They knew what was what. As a scientist myself, reading these papers was a breath of fresh air and impressed upon me their commitment to doing the science. Dates published on those papers are 2006, and this qualification process takes about two years. I believe that's what Drew Engeloff at ATI meant when he said, That's nine months before launch. That is an absurdly short time frame. The normal time frame would probably be like two years. Tests are the key. They tested stuff and they shook it. You know what they found? 5% of the stuff broke because of how they did it. 1.5% was due to the design of the component. 3.5% was workmanship for a total of 5% of the stuff. But they explained why. And they're like, hey, there's going to be mishaps because we're humans and all the workmanship's not going to be perfect. You need to know it's there. You need to go find it. And the way you find it is test. The one thing that always happened is people tried to figure out how to delete tests from the test plan. Oh, man, we're six months behind. How do we gain that schedule? We delete that test that takes eight months. We were launching in November of 2005 and we did not see our first silicon from the CPU until February of 2005. This is ridiculous. Do you see better disbelief in Todd Holmdahl's face too? I'll tell you what I don't see, the face of a man who made that decision. I don't know if he had the courage to have the words with management about delaying launch, stressing the importance of proper testing, but it seems like Microsoft had a dysfunctional culture that required people to speak up in fear of losing their jobs, which is a powerful incentive to keep your head down. Whatever happened internally that shortened the testing schedule definitely put them at risk of experiencing an unexpected product failure, and as it turned out, there were plenty. I'm about as sure as I can be that if Amcor was involved in the GPU design process when they saw high lead bumps and low TG underfills being chosen, they would have said no. That was specifically named as a bad combination in their research, and it wouldn't have taken two years to solve the issue. That's why I'm inclined to think that all defective chips from TSMC were packaged by ASE, who has packaging facilities in Taiwan and Korea. I believe that's what these markings mean, AA Taiwan and FG Korea. How do I know the defective Xbox 360 and PS3 GPUs have the bump gate materials, you may ask? Because I tested them. All right, so basically what I'm doing is I'm pressing into the margin of the underfill. The temperature of the soldering iron set to 150 degrees will press in and melt through the underfill if it's low enough. And you can see a difference when it's higher. So these are all bad 360 GPUs. The thermal glassification temperature is lower on them. You can also see the ultraviolet results. It will fluoresce green if it's a bad underfill. And here's all of the GPUs I tested and I've placed them into various categories. Red for bad underfill and green for fixed and reliable underfill. And for comparison, here's a PS3's 90 nanometer GPU, which was an open question about whether or not it was affected by bump gate. Uh, this result shows that it's very much the same as known bump gate affected chipsets there to the right. And I've also been able to confirm that it has high lead bumps. So it does have the bump gate material set. 340, 350. Okay, it looks like they're they're going now. 350. 360. Yeah, they're they're all uh, molten now. 360 it looks like. Yeah, those are high lead bumps. Since the same material set also appears in the 90 nanometer PS3 GPU and many bump gate affected GPUs from Nvidia at the time, I think it's reasonable to conclude the packaging partners were the most culpable. ATI and Nvidia were perhaps not as vigilant as they could have been. Microsoft can be forgiven for not being materials experts themselves, but ultimately they were involved and could have exercised more oversight, set longer testing schedules instead of racing to market with an untested product. They were the forward face of the product and would catch all the blame. 
On the NVIDIA side, Mark Lapidus in an article for EE Times entitled NVIDIA Takes Charge for Bad Chips, But Who's to Blame, wrote, quote, The packaging material was supplied by TSMC, according to a spokesman for NVIDIA, in an email. In subsequent emails, NVIDIA somewhat backpedaled and changed its explanation, which blamed TSMC for the problem. With regards to TSMC, we are not blaming TSMC, the NVIDIA spokesman said in a second email. Also, to be clear, the material set was co-qualified between NVIDIA and TSMC. This matter concerns complex issues involving multiple parties and all parties are working together to better understand the situation, according to a TSMC spokesman. End quote. The two things that stood out to me were, they said the packaging material was supplied by TSMC and co-qualified by TSMC and NVIDIA. All parties are working together. NVIDIA doesn't mention TSMC's packaging partners, presumably ASE. NVIDIA refers to both of them as if, from their perspective, TSMC and their packaging partner are one entity, which makes sense if NVIDIA left packaging up to TSMC's discretion and wasn't as involved in the nitty-gritty material selection. They place an order and let TSMC best figure out how to package it, since they're the experts. This makes me wonder how in-depth their co-qualification process really was, certainly not as thorough as Amcor and IBM's. This is a part of the partnership we don't have details on and why I cannot place blame on anyone in particular. It's a close working partnership between the console designers, GPU designers, foundry, and packaging partners. They all scratch each other's back and need to do repeat business. No one wants to burn a bridge with the world's leading silicon fab. So the details of their individual roles, who made the underfill and bump selection, and whether or not a materials expert was consulted, is kept a closely guarded secret behind non-disclosure agreements. However, it's in the best interests of the designers, ATI and NVIDIA, to maintain oversight over the decisions of their fabrication and packaging partners to have final approval. They should have had their own materials expert look over the final designs and tested product samples in a silicon failure analysis laboratory to be sure there wasn't an issue. And the console designers, Microsoft and Sony, for the same reason, should have had experts analyze the final designs, assemble prototypes, and test them to failure. If everyone had enough time to do their jobs perfectly, this preventable defect shouldn't have slipped past all redundancy layers and be discovered by customers, as IBM and Ancor proved was possible. Time wasn't on Microsoft's side. They said, we had to find a way to beat up production. Instead of micromanaging every detail, trusting your partners have it covered will speed up production. Microsoft trusting ATI had the GPU covered, and ATI trusting TSMC had silicon and packaging covered. Regardless of whose fault it is, the launch window placed a firm time constraint on a process that necessarily takes a longer time than they had. Nine months is not enough time to ensure this fault would be discovered and corrected. It was only enough time to discover there were normal pre-launch issues. Microsoft didn't have enough time for this kind of bump failure to occur in quality assurance testing. Someone at Microsoft made the executive decision not to delay launch. TSMC, ASE, and ATI would all get together and collaborate on the GPU design, having the relevant discussions about how to properly design a chip. So for a fundamental flaw like this to be missed, it probably means a materials expert wasn't consulted or didn't spot it. That's what I mean by there was a lack of oversight. It was some manager's job to make sure that consultant was in that meeting. If the materials expert didn't spot the issue, they screwed up. If that meeting didn't take place or got cut for time, it would have been a failure in management. And I have it on good authority, at least in the case of the Xbox 360's GPU, TSMC was delegated responsibility to choose its own packaging partners and was heavily involved in the physical design of the chip, meaning it was likely a failure between TSMC and its packaging partners. Partner. It's less likely that ATI was directly involved in that decision, and even less likely Microsoft was. But they're not free from responsibility themselves. ATI's name is on the design, and they would get blamed for a fault, just like Microsoft would for it being in their 360. Even though it wasn't directly their fault, the captain is responsible for the actions of its crew members, for better or worse. On July 5th, 2007, Peter Moore announced Microsoft would extend the warranty to three years from the time of original purchase and that would cost them around a billion dollars. Even if they weren't the most culpable, Microsoft decided to jump on that grenade, protecting their supply chain and customers in one painful blow. Repair rates times a dollar times a customer times an amount equals a number. Peter had to go to Steve Ballmer and say, bad news, I need a billion dollars to fix this issue. I'm expecting 
to be ripped to shreds. Come on! It is a make or break situation for Xbox. If Steve Ballmer does not give Peter more the money to go fix it, Xbox is dead. Like, there's probably no question about it. To the credit of Steve, and I can still see him looking at me right now, he said, do it. Just do it. We'll figure it all out. We'll take the hit. Microsoft will spend at least a billion dollars to repair serious hardware failures with its Xbox 360 video game console. Kudos to Microsoft for stepping up and putting their money where the red ring of death was. It was one of the times when I've been proudest to be part of Microsoft because we made a mistake, we owned it, and we did the right thing for consumers. Without that money spent, without them taking the problem head on, there's probably no Xbox right now. We bet on our fans and our brand and took the hit. Take that hit once, do it right, don't ever regret it. So while Microsoft's documentary made it look like they did the right thing, they left out the fact that they initially tried to weasel out of it. It wasn't until public pressure forced their hand. Bumpgate caused premature failures in many chipsets, not just the PS3 and 360's GPU, but other chipsets across the entire electronics industry, from graphics cards and laptops to special SOCs in random devices. Because of the cover-up, we don't know all the chipsets that were affected. The only ones we know for certain are those named in the class action lawsuit against NVIDIA. A failure of oversight during product qualification prior to launch is what ultimately allowed the defective material set to be sold. Customers are not quality assurance representatives, beta testers. They're not paid to discover hardware or software faults. They bought a finished product and rightfully expect a standard level of quality and reliability from brands they trust. These launch problems tarnished that reputation and angered many who paid the early adopters tax in good faith that Microsoft and Sony would stand by their product, make them whole if something went wrong. Was that trust misplaced? One way to gauge whether a company is trustworthy is how they initially deal with responses of issues. So let's see how they responded to the first reports there was a problem. Microsoft say most people with an Xbox 360 have an outstanding experience and there's no common fault. Each incident is unique and looked on on a case by case basis and they say they do everything they can uh, when people have problems. I've had the, the, probably the worst service I've ever had from a company from Microsoft, and I feel it's unacceptable. Paying £280 on an Xbox 360 for the last 14 months and be a hardware fault, that really annoyed me. He'll have to fork out nearly £80 to get his Xbox fixed. Watchdog has had 248 complaints about the faulty Xbox 360s, and as more units come out of warranty, that number keeps going up. According to Dean Takahashi in this VentureBeat article, by early 2007 that number had grown equal to the number of consoles Microsoft shipped on launch day. In just over a year, it's as if every launch console had died. If they didn't realize they had a problem before, they clearly had one now. A console is about to be born. And we are here, the midwives of American gaming culture, ready to receive the placenta-soaked PS3 into our loving hands. That's gross. Oh no, you did not shoot that green stuff at me. Having fired the first shots of the seventh generation console wars, Microsoft was hot on Sony 6. But at E3 2006, they were finally ready to show what their engineers had spawned. E3 2006, all eyes were on Sony. A bunch of us were huddled around one person's laptop streaming Sony's press conference. Coming off the PlayStation 2, Sony had done everything right, the most successful platform in game industry history. So they were riding on this tidal wave of success and goodwill from gamers. They felt that they were untouchable. We knew they were going to be somewhat arrogant. The next generation doesn't start until we say it does. November 17th, 2006. And then they dropped the price. Stepping up to the mic, he delivers the hit. The 20 gigabyte PlayStation 3 will retail for 499 US dollars and the 60 gigabyte for 599 US dollars. Holy cow, we just got handed this generation. We were high-fiving each other, people were crying. 599, <laughs> nobody was prepared for that. 
back then, consoles didn't launch at those kind of price points. You have an over-engineered machine that's going to be incredibly expensive to manufacture. Sony said it would be a privilege for people to work extra hours to afford their overly priced console. Thank you very much and have a great show. And the crowd goes wild. Like a truck too late to dodge, the promise of Sony's next generation console hit our eyes and ears. While Microsoft was in the midst of Red Ring of Death turmoil, Sony was launching the PlayStation 3, thinking they were going to benefit from the situation. But after launch, the reception was underwhelming. It was clear that only diehard PS3 and Blu-ray enthusiasts were willing to pay five to six hundred dollars for a console. That last one is worth mentioning. In the summer of 2006, the first Blu-ray player was released. The Samsung BDP-1000 retailed for a thousand dollars. The PS3 would do a lot more than just play Blu-rays and was half the cost. So if you just waited a few months, you could buy a PS3 instead. For many people, the PS3 was their first and only Blu-ray player. Microsoft backed the HD DVD format and trying to compete with Sony's Blu-ray format, at the same time the PS3 released, Microsoft stocked store shelves with an Xbox 360 accessory HD DVD player, which would cost $199. But it was awkward and an additional expense. If you were to buy a core system for $299 or a 360 for $399 and an HD DVD player, well now the price is the same as a PS3, which has a Blu-ray player built in. Oh, and by the way, I don't know if you've heard the 360's DVD drive, but it goes brrrr. The PS3's Blu-ray drive is just much quieter. For people on the fence that wanted both HD movies and games, the PS3 was just a cleaner package. Not only could Sony fit everything into one box, but the entire game could fit on one disc. No loading disc like the 360 has. Ultimately, Blu-ray would win out. In no small part thanks to Sony's decision to include a Blu-ray drive in every console. Not only that, but unlike the 360, the PS3 would have an HDMI port, a full digital-to-digital -digital AV signal ready for modern displays. Although at the time most TVs were still analog CRTs, flat panel plasma and LCDs were becoming more standard, including an HDMI port from day one was forward thinking. This was one advantage for being a year late for the seventh generation. They could arrive with features the 360 didn't have. Despite all that, sticker shock was real. Most casual gamers were priced out of the seventh generation in those early years. It was the reason I didn't get a PS3 until 2009. I got a Black Friday deal on a 120 gigabyte slim model, a CECH 2001A. For me, $300 was the sweet spot. I couldn't justify paying more. Besides, I was still content playing original Xbox, PS1, PS2, GameCube, and Wii. I had a sizable backlog of games I hadn't played, and with work and school, less time to play them. My first backwards compatible 60GB A model I bought used for $250 from GameStop in 2012. It seemed crazy to spend more than that, and the sales numbers show I wasn't alone in that thinking. Sony would have to quickly cut costs and make the console cheaper if they wanted to compete with Microsoft's more budget-friendly offerings. About a year later, reports of PlayStation 3's very own Yellow Light of Death had Team Green mocking them. Welcome to the party, noobs. It reminds me of a year back when I was in line for the 360. Things have really gone full circle. Eerily similar issues involving black screens, artifacting, problems PC video card and Xbox 360 customers were already familiar with. But all Sony customers got was a stonewall PR response. Sony stress PS3s don't have an inherent defect and say if the consoles go wrong within one year of purchase, they'll replace them for free. If you get the yellow light of death after that, Sony want more money to sort it out. So if your box breaks, you can either throw it away or pay £128 for a refurbished model. Have any of you paid the £128? No, I considered it, but um, they told me that I would only get a three-month warranty. Okay, um, so you might have to pay again after three yeah, months of it. told breaks. me that if it breaks down again yeah. after three months, I'd have to pay another £128. The disappoint is that a small number of their two and a half million customers appear to have experienced problems after the warranty has expired. They say it's common business practice to charge for repairs after one year and that they don't profit from the costs of that. What's the small amount of customers? Twelve and a half thousand that they're admitting to. But there could be loads more. Because solder fatigue is a thermal-related issue, it takes varying amounts of time for the connections to break. 
PS3's GPU has a different thermal design power, construction, and its cooling solution change factors that greatly influence mean time before failure. Since reports of issues during its one-year warranty were relatively small compared to the 360, and even two years out, they were still not high enough to mount sufficient public pressure, Sony's gaslighting tactics worked. They were able to avoid ever taking public responsibility or a recall. To this day, Sony has maintained that the yellow light of death was a general hardware error that doesn't have a common cause, and the early models don't have an inherent defect. While the 360's Red Ring of Death issue affected nearly all of their launch models, far more than Sony's Yellow Light of Death, Microsoft at least attempted to make it right. When we got to the point where we said, we're not figuring this out fast enough, we made the call to shut down production. When someone truly cares, they take complaints seriously and seize the opportunity to reinforce the trust their loyal customers placed in them by coming to them with the issue. When the 360 died on me, I was pissed that it died, but I wasn't pissed at Microsoft. I just really wanted to get the 360 again and start playing again because it was just awesome. It was frustrating, but they had hooked us. So when you hook somebody, you know, you know they're not gonna leave. They're gonna work with you through the difficult times. That was a good sign that people love the thing that you're building. It is the time to provide a pleasant customer service experience during a bad situation. You don't call them a liar. You don't make them jump through long phone loops. You don't attempt to discourage them in any way, procedurally, structurally, none of this intentional complexity we often see today. A company that puts their customer first builds trust and loyalty. They provide reassurance that they're committed to honoring their warranty and providing a satisfactory resolution. And it's rare to find nowadays. It stands out when a company prides themselves on it to a fault. When they accept the minority of abuses that such a policy allows, take a hit in order to provide reassurance to the majority of honest customers. In effect saying, we're willing to take your side, even when it hurts us to do so, because we want to earn your repeat business, that we hold your interests above our profit margin as a core value, believing that doing so will work out in both our best interests in the long run. And that's really where trust is built. It's clear both Sony and Microsoft initially attempted to downplay the issue, hoping public pressure wouldn't force their hand. Is there any speculation out there what the problem is? Um, there's a lot of speculation, but because, well, among other things, there are 500 million transistors and 1,700 parts in each of these boxes. Mm -hmm. So the speculation could go anywhere. What causes this exactly? That's kind of part of the problem, Kevin. Uh, Microsoft has been very vague about the specific causes. They won't cite any specifics. They won't say exactly why. Guess Sliding aside, we just couldn't figure it out. The Xbox 360's issue were so acute, the failure rate was near 100%. It couldn't be ignored. If they did, it could have killed Xbox as a brand. Whereas Microsoft had to act or face the end of Xbox, Sony was able to navigate the Tempest by refusing to rescue its most loyal fans, the ones who paid five to six hundred dollars for the early models. Okay, I need to address an issue with my Yellow Light of Death documentary. First, I said that Sony doesn't make every single part in-house. That's true. But we're mainly talking about the GPU here. So the question is, who made the RSX? Second, I said there were three major players. The console designers, GPU designers, and the fab that actually made the silicon. This leaves out two major players, the assemblers and the packager. Since completing that video, I've continued to dig into this topic, and I have uncovered more context to Sony's partnership. In a 2007 fiscal year review, Sony outlines their plans for 08 and beyond. In the presentation, they say the 90 nanometer RSX production was at Sony's Nagasaki Fab 2. That's the silicon die. You'll note this isn't TSMC. Now, now, I was aware that Sony originally stated they would be making the RSX in-house. However, I had read speculation in forum posts around 2006 that Sony would outsource production to TSMC for the 90 nanometer RSX, since PS2 cells were still strong and they needed to keep producing the Emotion Engine plus graphic synthesizer. EEGS, which is the combined CPU and GPU for the PlayStation 2. The launch PS3 used this chip for PS2 backwards compatibility, and it's what makes the PS3 a PS2. The thing about these silicon fabs is that they're extremely expensive to build, and they specialize in their manufacturing node. There's a range of nodes they can produce. If you want to go higher or lower, you have to build another facility or retool for it. And here's the kicker. There is a short window to recover that investment. The value of chips 
made at the cutting edge manufacturing node drops quickly, making them less and less profitable, a fab has a short period of time to break even. Because after that, profit margins on chips are so low that they may never see a return. So they tend to run at 90 plus percent output at all times, cranking out as much silicon as possible. With the 90 nanometer EEGS in full swing for PS2, whose sales were still strong, and even more of them going into the PS3, along with Sony's other 90 nanometer tech, I thought it was plausible that they might have had a hard time adding an entirely new SKU to their Nagasaki Fab 2 facility and instead outsource production of the 90 nanometer RSX to TSMC in order to meet tight production schedules for the PS3 launch. The slides in this presentation suggest otherwise, but I don't have video or anything else that confirms they made the RSX in-house. However, I do think this source is more effective official than scuttlebutt on technical forum back channels. However, I find the truth tends to come out more in these back channels among engineers. I just can't ever confirm any of it, and we have to instead trust official spin. But Sony says they would, or had, changed from in-house production to foundry procurement. It's unclear if they were talking about future plans or had done so already. All I have are these slides. Anyway, it has the RSX in parentheses under OITA TS Semiconductor Corp. That's a packaging facility. Again, I can't be certain if they mean the 90 nanometer RSX was produced at Nagasaki Fab 2 and then packaged at Oita TEC. The slides are saying the 65 nanometer will be and this large scale integration will improve yields. They project better quality and yields from the 65 nanometer LSI moving forward, implying there may have been issues with the 90 nanometer. This doesn't rule out the idea TSMC made the 90 nanometer RSX, but it does show they have had facilities capable of producing and packaging the 90 nanometer RSX in-house, which is reasonable doubt. So let's explore the assumption that they did fab and package it there. The next slide, however, seems to insinuate they may not have been the one to package the dies. They were considering packaging in-house and go on to project full integration of packaging moving forward. This could be looked at two ways. One, it could imply they hadn't been up to this point. In this slide, they were talking about their plans to make the company more profitable. So it reads as a what we intend to do, which we aren't fully now kind of a thing. Or two, it could simply mean they had been packaging in-house and were considering outsourcing packaging. It's unclear from the slides, which they mean. Ugh. I wish there was footage of the presentation. <sighs> like I said, Sony is harder to pin down. Their packaging partnerships are complicated and they don't release information. That's specifically to make it hard for people like me trying to pin the tail on the donkey. They put on the blindfold, sit back and laugh while we pin it on TSMC and make a jackass out of ourselves, trying to piece it all back together. Where does he get that stuff? How do you ever expect to be a real boy? What's he think I look like? A jackass? You sure do! <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've been double crossed! Help! Help! Somebody help! I've been framed! Okay, here are the facts as I see them. Nvidia? TSMC and their packaging partners co-qualified the GPUs involved in the Bumpgate lawsuit. G84 and G86 product change notifications identifies Namix U8439-1 low TG underfill. My own poke test confirms G84, G86, the bad Xbox 360 GPUs, and 90 nanometer RSX have indistinguishable melting temps. UV fluorescence and their visible color support this. Fixed Xbox 360 for the fixed 65 nanometer and 40 nanometer RSX, as well as the Cell BE, which is the CPU, all confirm my poke test and the UV visual tests do not produce similar results on known good underfills. The bad underfills just look different and behave different. This confirms my methodology actually works. I have tested to my satisfaction that the 90 nanometer RSX does have the defective material set. If doubters want to have the 90 nanometer RSX underfill empirically tested by a silicon failure analysis laboratory, you're welcome to put your money where your doubts are. Nvidia was involved in RSX development and the bump gate affected chipsets. Now let's add in some assumptions. 
Let's assume NVIDIA and Sony's fab and packaging team co-qualified the 90 nanometer RSX. That in-house packaging was done there instead of being sent to a third-party packager like ASE, with whom NVIDIA presumably had done business with in connection with dies ordered from TSMC, just like ATI had done with faulty Xbox 360 GPUs. Just because Sony may have packaged the 90 nanometer RSX doesn't mean they wouldn't take advice from NVIDIA on what materials they used to make the G70 and G71 GPUs the RSX is designed on. Remember, everyone is working together in these partnerships. They all scratch each other's backs and they listen to each other's expert opinions in order to make these decisions. So it's not unlikely that TSMC, ASE, and NVIDIA were all sharing knowledge and in NVIDIA shared that knowledge with Sony's packaging engineers. We know that the Xbox 360's CPU cores were actually designed by IBM, and IBM had shared information about the Cell BE's cores, and it made it into the CPU of the 360. So clearly, they are all working together and sharing knowledge behind the scenes, even going so far as to compromise high-value-added manufacturing technology. I'm sure Sony was pissed about that. And even even if that's too far of a stretch to believe, then perhaps Sony fell victim to the same trap many others did. They were all basing their low TG underfill decisions on worthless data, telling them it was bulletproof. In the article, Low TG Underfill, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, the authors write, quote, first, in regards to low TG underfill, all tests based on JESD22-A104, which was an industry standard testing procedure for thermal cycling a computer chip to failure are worthless. Let me repeat that, worthless. Second, the industry may soon reach a decision point. The immediate response to the low TG underfill fiasco was to ban low TG underfill from all products, assuming the OEM customers knew about it. The result is that there are relatively few companies still using low TG underfill, or if they are, they are making a concerted effort to ensure the operating temperature is far away from the TG. This has resulted in a number of mid-TG products, where the TG is not as low as the 70 degrees Celsius that caused failures, but not as high as the original 125 to 150 degrees Celsius." End quote. And that's exactly what Microsoft did to fix their GPUs. The first two fixed GPUs started appearing in the 360s in early 2008, some of which had markings HTG85 and HTG130. I believe this stands for High TG. G85 and 130 degrees Celsius, respectively. Josh and I speculate these were a test to see which was more reliable, before switching to what looks like high TG85 for the revised Y1, Rhea, and Zeus GPUs. I couldn't get my hands on a sample of HTG85 to try the poke test on them, not in time for this video, so I can't confirm if they are the same, but the color of HTG130 is creamy white, and the fixed reliable chips moving forward are a closer color match to HTG85. However, starting with the Zephyr B and C motherboard revisions, Microsoft did lower the thermal target, but not to below the 70 Celsius TG of the underfill. Whoops. Had they done so, it might have made the GPU, um, less unreliable. I won't go as far as to say reliable. I don't have any evidence to suggest that increasing fan speeds prevents Red Ring of Death. I just know people claim it helps. Here's the thing though. We've seen fan potentiometer modded consoles die from the same old GPU failures, so it's not a simple matter of cooling. Theoretically, it might help, but there's so much more that goes into it that I can't go as far as to say adjusting a thermal target is preventative maintenance. It's just something you can try, but if you must, Please don't install those pot mods. You can adjust the thermal targets stored on the console itself, which is better anyway. But if you do, don't touch the CPU target. The CPU is a tank, it doesn't need your help. And beware, this will make your console loud. The same goes for the PS3. You can jailbreak and install Webman Mod. It has a dynamic fan control, which maintains 68 degrees Celsius. I'd recommend leaving it there. You can also adjust the Syscon fan tables themselves if you want it to be persistent. It doesn't require a jailbreak. Besides that, there's not much more you can do. Changing paste, keeping it dust free, well ventilated, and hoping for the best. Now there are two more misconceptions I need to clear up. 
first. I said we didn't know if the first revision CXD 2982 65 nm RSX was or was not affected by Bumpgate, that the timeline suggested it could have been. I have since confirmed that all 65 nanometer model RSXs have good underfill and there doesn't appear to be an increased failure rate in models with them. In fact, I recently picked up two four parts for repair EIA-002 motherboard revisions specifically to test these GPUs. And the Syscon reported that they both lasted over a thousand 24 hour days before their NEC tokens failed. The 65 nanometer RSX is a tank. So stop body shaming the fat PS3s just because it's fat. It's not fat, it's fat. And that brings us the second misconception and how I was wrong. The NEC tokens are the leading cause of the yellow light of death in models that have NEC tokens but do not have a 90 nanometer RSX. So most non-backwards compatible fats and the first slim. People were hoping the backwards compatible models were all bad tokens and that the 90 nanometer GPU was fine. They were wrong. However, if your PS3 has a 65 nanometer RSX, then the tokens are the most likely cause. These consoles are getting old and the caps are only rated to last so long. Dare I say, Naked Snake is vindicated? I suppose it was inevitable eventually. The caps can't last forever, and as we Frankenstein fat mod more and more backwards compatible models with reliable GPUs, eventually they'll all be tokens. Getting back to Sony's 2007 review, they emphasize large scale integration and even finish the presentation off with the advantage of having a significant in-house set business. They wanted more control over the entire process, which is something Microsoft wanted as well, and is one of the reasons they state they went with ATI. Sony's implying they didn't have as much control as they would have liked, and were taking steps to gain more specifically including the PSP, PS2, and PS3 in that section, as if nodding to their game plan for cost savings and profitability in that sector moving forward. And these slides show what their expenditures had been in major sectors and how they were prioritizing them. The PS3, PS2, and PSP were the costliest in 2004 and 5. And as they launched the PS3, sales started offsetting development costs, but they were still losing approximately $300 on every consoles sold. Their engineers slimmed the PS2 and were feverishly developing cost-down versions of the PS3, axing PS2 backwards compatibility, slim versions, and would eventually turn a profit on console sales. They used these savings and diverted investment to image sensors instead. This shift coincided with Ken Kutaragi's departure from Sony the father of PlayStation. You can see he was facing immense pressure to reduce game expenditures, as the parent company Sony prioritized investment into image sensors instead. Ken pushed to get his PS3 vision of full backwards compatibility made. An overpriced and over-engineered console? Yeah. Awesome? Oh yeah. And he did so against the profit stream of the larger company. Booyah, Grandma! Booyah! Apparently, he burned bridges at Sony to bring us the launch PS3. It was his departing gift to gamers. It was his Sony swan song. Now that Ken was out of the way, they could make it as cheap as possible, which isn't a bad thing. Remember, most people didn't want to pay five to six hundred dollars for a game console. It's the reason I didn't get a launch PS3 and waited until the slim release. If Sony wanted to compete with Microsoft in the seventh generation console war, they needed to get the price down. Ken already took care of the diehard gamers with backwards compatible models. Now it was time to get a PS3 in everyone else's living room. Similarly, Microsoft needed to deal with its issue as well. This was something that could tarnish the brand. They needed to do not just something, they needed to do the right thing. If we're gonna save this brand, we need first-class consumer service reaction to this. The credibility of the whole platform really, I think, hung in the balance. There's only one way to do this, and that is you have to fix every console for every customer at no cost, no questions asked. I think we're off to a good start. Uh-huh. That was little consolation to the early adopters. There was a six month period of time after the one year warranty expired when customers were denied coverage and would have to pay to have their Xbox fixed, only to have them break again and again, having to pay each time. Until Microsoft made that decision, there were plenty of customers they let down. I'd be angry too. 
but it's important to note that Microsoft did retroactively refund anyone that had previously paid to have their console fixed, so at least they could get their money back. Here's the thing, three years should be enough time for the Red Ring of Death to take out your defective console, if you play it regularly. If you were casual and didn't use it that much, you could probably make it past that three year extension before it died. And I imagine there were a lot of people that missed the extended warranty period when their console finally did die. Luckily, by then Microsoft had fixed the issue and the price had dropped. So replacing it with a reliable console wouldn't be too bad. I have a 2005 Xenon still running fine to this day. I picked it up for 20 bucks, not working, four parts, expecting it was a goner. I intended to use it for footage of the Red Ring of Death in this video and maybe fix it in a future video. But when I got it, the thing worked. <laughs> It was factory sealed, no bolt mod nonsense. It just had some leaky CPU caps, which is common. I'll have to deal with that soon, but none of it looks to have leaked on the motherboard where it could corrode traces, so I haven't yet. I've been playing on it a little bit, and it seems fine, despite the leaky caps. Either it was never used much, or it won the silicon lottery. To tell you the truth, I really like this console. Bad GPU and leaky caps? Walk it off! What a juggernaut. Point is, there are always some percentage of consoles that prove to be reliable and some that break just by looking at it cross. It's a matter of odds. And if your console made it this far, chances are you got lucky. The A model PS3 I bought from GameStop in 2012 has worked fine since the day I got it. Never gave me any problems. I've heard the same story from many people. I don't know how long my defective launch models will last, but I plan to enjoy them while they do. I'm going to give them the honor of fulfilling their purpose, to play games, instead of sequestering them away in fear of them dying. Actually, I'm kind of excited to have that launch model experience now in 2024, exploring the seventh generation library. The best thing is it's currently still affordable. This generation has only just started getting collectible and post COVID prices have fallen. Now is the time to get deals. That's my philosophy about gaming. I have a backlog of games too large to play anyway. I do support development of games on current gen consoles when there's a game I really want to play. But for the most part, I stay a few generations back and buy used. And this is a good time to introduce my rubric for grading the consoles and telling you who I think won the seventh generation console war. I've created a table with various categories, each one worth five points. Whichever console has the most points at the end wins. First category is launch date. 360 wins for getting out first. Despite having launch issues and reliability problems, Microsoft did the right thing for customers. Sony never admitted anything. Although the launch model PS3s proved more reliable, I'm gonna have to give the 360 the win for crisis handling. This is from my perspective as a gamer. I bet Sony considers avoiding a billion dollar recall a win, even though it shifts the cost burden onto its customers. One of the issues with being first though, is that the PS3 could come out with features the 360 didn't have at launch. So although 360 models came out later with HDMI, PS3 gets the AV output win for having HDMI on day one. It also wins the HD video format with Blu-ray and the most powerful hardware category. 360 fires back with the first achievement system, first wireless and most ergonomic controller, being the most power efficient and better third-party support support for the first few years, at least until developers learn to fully utilize the PS3's superior horsepower, cross-platform games just ran better on 360. First party games from Sony did run great though. Both 360 and PS3 allowed you to customize the menu theme, but I'll give the 360 the customization win for its faceplates. Man, 360 came out firing. Quite all right, Big Daddy. It's all right, Craig. They ain't got nothing for us. Let's push it. We gotta go. Gotta go. I can't shake him. I can't shake. Yes, you can. Just the way I showed you. Let's go. Check me out, Felix. I'ma try something. Man, don't do nothing stupid over there. You know me. That's what I'm talking about. Ah. Frankie, Frankie, what are you doing? You can't bank at that speed. Ah. Frankie, he's closing on you. <laughs> Put your mask back on. That's an order machine. I can't breathe. Frankie. <laughs> Frankie, no! 
PS3 lands a huge blow with free online multiplayer, and when properly maintained, it's quieter. The 360's DVD drive is quite noisy, or at least mine is, I've heard some of the later ones are less noisy. PS3 gets another win for an internal power supply. This can be looked at as a good or bad thing depending on your perspective. Some say it adds heat, but not really, I've tested that. I think it's a good thing because you don't need to worry about losing a power brick or finding the right one when buying a used console. When I got my 360 used, I had to spend another $25 on the right power brick to even use it. An annoyance you don't need to worry about with the PS3 unless the PSU dies. And it only takes up the footprint of the console itself. No giant brick to find a place for. For user interface, I'm giving the win to PS3's X menu bar, XMB. While Blades was cool, and I think it could have given XMB a run for its money, Microsoft decided to replace it with Metro, which I really don't like. Whereas XMB was used on both PSP and PS3, it is, in my opinion, the best user interface of any console. Actually, I'm not even sure I want to qualify that. It's hard to think of any interface I like better, period. While 360's backwards compatibility is impressive, PS3 wins hands down. If you have an A or B model, it's nearly impossible to find a game that doesn't work, one you'd want to play anyway. And if you have an E or C model, the PS2 upscaling actually is better in many games. Yeah, it did lose some PS2 backwards compatibility. Nobody really seems to know how much compatibility was lost there. Backwards compatible with somewhere between 82 and 95% of the PS2 library with many of the games that do work having glitches and artifacts. But most of the games that partial emulation broke have an HD remaster on PS3. Actually, one could argue that the inaccuracies improve Silent Hill 2, where James Sutherland's leg or hand will randomly pop out of existence, which makes the game even more creepy. Speaking of games, according to the Metacritic score of their respective catalogs of exclusive titles, the win goes to the PS3 with an overall score of 73% versus 360's 68%. As for which are your favorites, that's highly subjective. Another win goes to the PS3 for other OS. It wins the utility beyond the console hands down for Linux support. PS3 arrays were used as a supercomputer back in the day and is still used today as a Linux box. Unfortunately, Sony would later remove the feature and get sued for doing so. And the last category is overall sales. In 2017, three years into the life of the PlayStation 4 and more than 10 years after the PS3's launch, Sony ended production of the PlayStation 3, bringing its reign to a close and making good on a promise. PlayStation 3 is not only going to be relevant in five years' time, but it's going to be a relevant platform even in 10 years' time. All totaled, more than 85 million have been sold, edging out Microsoft's 84 million Xbox 360s, despite being beaten to market by a year. Well, there you have it. It went back and forth for a while, but according to my rubric, the grand winner was Sony, with the score of 55 to 40. PS3 wins the seventh generation console war behind the week. See if you can fly that thing to cover. <laughs> Hope you got an airbag. I'm sure there are a bunch more categories I could have added, and if you think I totally missed something, feel free to add it into the comments section. It's time to end this extremely long video that rambled on for way longer than it should have. But that's my style, and I'm not going to make any apologies for it. Lastly, huge shout out and thanks to Josh, aka Octal450, for fact checking the technical aspects of the Xbox 360 I present in this video. His massive effort to research the 360 reminds me of my own obsession with the PS3. The guy is just a wealth of information and skill. We did our best to make sure the information presented here is as accurate as possible with available information. The best of my ability to reiterate it. And I had a blast exploring the 360 with him. Thank you so much, man. And thank you to everyone else who helped in the community. Without the greats whose shoulders I stood upon to get here, this video wouldn't have been possible. The same goes for you. Yeah, you. 
Viewers like you are the entire reason I made this life-draining video that ate up all my free time. If you just stopped watching and subscribing, I wouldn't have to. To be completely honest, I'm not sure how I feel about this. It's equal parts wonderful and terrifying. Came in super hot with a hard take. One reception, but a couple mistakes. Boom, gate is a thing, even Microsoft said it. Give a cat a credit and a little off and said it. Of course, I put the time in, now I have to make them thread it. It was breaking cause the heat, it couldn't take it. You was thinking you was wrong cause it wasn't overheating. CPU wasn't breaking, so it couldn't be the boss. The bumps are very brittle and the stress is not so little. Aw oh, man, my box died. I think it fine. I gotta go on Reddit and find out why. I'm a blow up in this mother if I hear a single mother movie try to tell me that. What I need to do is. Just stop it. Get some help. No stars on Yelp. But Josh is the man. Thanks, bro. A lot of doubters were spitting facts, though. Haters gonna hate. They do it at their peril. Selling Haters consoles at the bottom of the barrel. Everybody wanna do the same thing, yup. That's why we ain't on the same page. Yo. Do my own thing and I maintain. Woo. Flow like water, so I'm going mainstream. I'm going mainstream. Flow like water, so I'm going mainstream. Yeah, I'm going mainstream. Flow like water, so I'm going mainstream. I'm going mainstream. Mainstream. Flow like water, so I'm going mainstream. Oh. 